In this video, I'm going to share with you three different phases of footwork. And if you understand these three phases of footwork, you can drastically improve how fast you move, how confident you move, and how much court you can cover if you're doing it the right way. So let's get started. Why is footwork so important? Well, footwork is important because it allows us to get to the ball to hit the ball. And that sounds simple enough. Like, of course, I need to get to the ball to hit the ball. But the goal is to have the kind of the trifecta of footwork being balanced, being able to rotate and hitting the ball in your strike zone. This is the purpose of footwork. And this is pretty much what makes the pros so good. We spend so much time looking at their swing and analyzing their swing, but we really should be spending more time looking at their footwork. If you really notice how they move, they move exquisitely, meaning that they take very difficult situations and make it look easy. So what happens is we work on our swing all the time and we have this pristine swing that works when some pro or a ball machine is hitting the ball perfectly. We get in a match and you're like, I never get a chance to use my swing. And this is why this video is important. So phase number one is the split step in your first move. Now let's talk about why is the split step so important. The split step is really about getting yourself moving so you're ready to take that energy and move it in a direction and it's timed correctly. So many people hear about the split step and say, oh, you mean I just need to hop? And so they just start hopping randomly between the ball. Now you see some players like even Djokovic, he'll hop a little bit, but the hop is very timed according to its opponent's contact. And this is why it's so important. It will actually make you quicker. It's also what I think is the governor. And what I mean by governor, like in the engine, preventing it from going faster. If you're trying to accomplish a higher rating or ranking, well, if you're not split stepping, it's not going to happen because you're always going to be a step late to the ball. Coming back to the first thing we talked about, which is if you're a step late or you're late getting to the ball, it's going to be hard to hit a consistent solid ball and you don't want that. So let's talk about what are the keys to the split step. First of all, to split step, you have to watch your opponent make contact with the ball. This is so different from so many players. They kind of hit the ball and they're like, okay, well, they hit it, I'll split. But you're too late and you're going to find yourself kind of always trying to catch up to the ball. What we want to do is once we hit the ball, we want to have the eyes follow the ball and see as our opponent is getting ready to make contact with the ball. Where we want to be is slightly in the air when your opponent makes con contact with the ball. So just like I'm doing this, as I see my, my opponent's racket getting closer to the ball, I'm actually starting to lift my body so when they make contact, I can then identify where the ball is going and then use the energy as I'm coming down to go in a direction, my first step. My first step usually has to do with my outside leg going in that direction. So if I were to split and come down, and I might do a first step to my right side if I'm hitting a forehand, or my left side if I'm doing a backhand. What you also see the pros doing is sometimes they recognize it early, and as they're in the air, they'll come down instead of touching down and then doing their outside leg, they'll come down into the outside leg. I recommend if you're new to split stepping or you're not very consistent with it, you just come down straight and then take the first step. Now the second type of split step, because there's two, is we want to make sure that you split step either off of both legs or one leg. And this is generally where it happens. When you don't know where the ball's coming, let's say aka a serve return, uh, you're in the middle of the court and you just don't know, boom, you generally get a two-footed split step. When you're hitting and you're off in the corner of the court and you're trying to recover, a lot of times as you're trying to recover, you're going to have to split step off of one leg and then land on two or split step off of one leg and recognize and then do your first step. And so it's very important that you understand this. These are the keys to the first phase of moving great on the court because you can't really move great if you don't get off to a great start. Just like if you're starting a race, there's no sense in having to run a race when your opponent is already 10 feet in front of you. And that's how it is when you're not split stepping correctly. The last part of phase one is starting to move out to the ball. What you wanna do when you think of moving out to the ball is take measured steps. And I would say as large a measure as you can. Let's think about somebody running track. What do you see them doing? What kind of steps do you think they're taking or see them taking when they're trying to accomplish speed? Large steps. You don't see somebody out there running a 100 yard uh, sprint taking small steps. They're taking large steps to cover more ground. This is the exact same thing we want to do on a tennis court. If we have to take a bunch of steps, it's actually going to slow us down. And that's why you don't see anyone running track taking tons of little steps to take long strides. And so with this, we want to measure our strides because we sometimes don't have to run a long distance. But when we do, we're going to take those big steps and take big enough steps so we can measure on the way. Now, obviously, we don't have to move that much. We can just shuffle over. And this is where you see the variety of different movements out to the ball. We see some players shuffle over because they don't have to move that much. And then you see some players that have to hustle out to a very wide ball, take bigger steps. Now, when should we take the small steps? Hmm. 
generally you're taking small steps because you've kind of misjudged the ball a little bit. You take the small steps though when you get closer to the contact with the ball. So you see players taking large steps to get to the ball and take stutter steps to adjust to the ball. And this is really crucial to understand this. Ideally, you don't want to have to take those stutter steps, but sometimes you might. It might be a windy day or something. Either way, understand that you want to measure and take the right amount of steps and get used to taking the right amount of steps more of the time. In phase two, we're gonna start talking about rotation, balance, and contact. Now, this kind of bleeds over into a free previous phase of phase one. As you're running, what you're trying to accomplish is making sure that, again, we can stay balanced, we can rotate, and we can hit the ball in our strike zone. So what this means is when we're running to the ball, we have to run to the ball in a way that allows us to get to the ball and hit the ball in my strike zone based on the bounce. So this means different things to different levels. In the beginning, you're probably not good at taking the ball on the rise. So what you have to do a lot of times is when the ball comes in really high, you have to back up to let the ball come back down into your strike zone. And this is one of the biggest mistakes generally beginners struggle with, with footwork. They don't understand that you want to try to take the ball in your strike zone, and they don't have the ability to take the ball on the rise or step up and take the ball early. And this is why it causes them to always have to kind of run back. This is also what makes them more susceptible to losing to pushers because a pusher will play defense or play the ball high, and they can't really take advantage of it. So you wind up being stuck at the baseline just hitting balls, hitting balls back and forth because you can't take the ball early and maybe take some time away from the pusher. You generally have two opportunities to hit the ball. You have one opportunity on the way up, and you have another opportunity on the way down. And as you get better, just like you see at the highest level with the pros, most of the pros almost always try to do the best to take the ball on the first bounce instead of the second. Because the advantages of taking on the first bounce is you're gonna take time away and you're not gonna give up court. So that's a little bit more strategic, but it plays into the footwork we wanna have. The second part is this. We're running to the ball trying to get into the contact, but we're also trying to set our position up so we can rotate. And so rotation is important because that's how you create racketed speed. If you watch any pro, and I do mean any pro, what they're doing is using their body to create racket speed. Yes, they can use their swing in the sense of stretching their shoulder and get internal, external rotation, but you see it, it's a combination of generally the body and then the swing. The body is really important if you wanna generate a maximum amount of pace. But again, you won't be able to do that all the time. And so this is why it's key to understand you wanna do your best to get there and make sure you can rotate. And Finally, you wanna be balanced. I shouldn't say finally, that should be probably the first thing. Because the reason balance is important is because when I'm balanced, I can hit a solid ball. I can control my racket face, which means I can control where the ball's going. If I'm running and I can't keep my balance, then I can't control the ball. Hence, I will be less consistent. And that's not what we want. We want footwork to help us improve our consistency, not take away from it. And so, the thing we wanna think about is first, arriving in an open stance. For most of the shots, as long as you have time, you wanna do your best to arrive on your outside leg in an open stance. And coaches and players may go, but I heard you shouldn't hit everything off an open stance. Now, listen to what I said. I said arrive, not hit. When you arrive in an open stance, you have still one more choice. If the ball's coming really fast, you can still rotate your body, achieve balance, rotation, and hit the ball in your strike zone if you move the correct way. Now. If let's say you get there and you're like, man, I still have some time and I, or I wanna take more time away from my opponent, I can simply go from an open stance to step in and go to a more neutral stance and then take the ball earlier. But the key is you can't do it backwards. I can't go from a neutral stance to an open stance. It just doesn't work. And that's why you wanna always arrive in open if you can and then go to a neutral. Now here's the caveat, because some people hear me say this and go like, well, um, some balls you just can't, and you're right, some balls you can't, and it depends on how bad your opponents hurt you. And in that case, you dull everything down to just getting the ball in, even if you have the worst footwork ever. Footwork then becomes survival, just getting yourself to the ball and probably playing defense and getting the ball in. But ideally, we want to accomplish these three things. The final phase is recovery. And a lot of times, what I think the best recovery is, is when you build it in to your actual shot. And you see a lot of players do this meaning that when they hit off the open stance, they'll hit in a way that allows them to recover and it's built in compared to hitting where I see a lot of recreational players, they'll hit their open stance, okay, and then they kind of kind of re-get their body going and then they go into the next shot. Or they hit even a neutral stance and stand there and then they have to get their body going. It just takes too much time, especially at a high level. So what you see the pros do is a lot of times they build in the recovery using breaking steps, pivot steps, if you're a neutral stance, coming around, getting their body to face in the next direction they need to recover. What also you need to understand when you're thinking about your footwork and recovery is where you're hitting the ball. Because this will dictate how much 
or how fast you have to get out of dodge to get to the next ball. Meaning that if I'm, let's say, on the single sideline and I hit the ball down the line, well, man, especially if I'm not approaching, I got a lot of court to cover on the other side. So therefore, I really wanna cross over and use my footwork. So you can see now how this all fits together, where you have to split step, move to the ball using your outside leg, move in a way that allows you to hit the ball in your strike zone, your balance, and you can rotate, and then build in your recovery into your shot and then get back by the time they hit the next shot and making sure that we have the right recovery position. Now that you understand this, let's go do some drills to break down all three of these. You can start practicing these to get better at your footwork. So the very first drill we're gonna do is focus on our split step and our very first step. Now, one thing is you wanna make sure you have a nice wide base when we move because if we have a very narrow base, it's very easy for us to lose balance and that breaks one of our first key tenets of having great footwork, which is balance. So what we wanna do is have a nice wide base. A great way of looking at this is having almost a racket length between your, your feet. From here, we wanna bend our knees and act like this is a suspension. Now, what we wanna do is get in a great athletic position. I'm gonna sit my butt down and when I'm split stepping, all I'm gonna do is this little hop. Go ahead and try it a couple times. This nice little hop. Now. This is great, but we have to time it. And so one key way of timing it in the beginning, just getting used to, to the timing of your opponent making contact is actually you work on you making contact and you hopping. So it's gonna be an hop. My racket is getting ready to hit the ball. This is where my legs are also bending to engage. And as it's coming up to make the contact, then I'm in the air. So if my opponent's making contact, as I start seeing where the ball's go, going, I can start making a direction uh, choice. So right here, contact. You'll feel the rhythm of lift and land. Lift and land. And I'm lifting and landing slightly after I make contact. Now, this isn't the best drill, but it's a great drill you can work with or work on by yourself. Now, another way of doing it is just hitting the fence and thinking of the fence as your opponent making contact. Now, when you do this, don't swing hard because you're gonna kind of swing and hit it and you're like, oh shoot, I got a split step too. So how this would look is simply going and Notice how, left hand, boom. Right about when the, the ball is making contact, I feel myself in the air, and a split second after, I'm landing. And this wants to be a rhythmical thing. And one of the biggest things I think that hurts players when they're trying to learn how to split stuff is the getting ready to lift so you can land. What happens is they wait too long and then they're at the last second having to jump and it doesn't feel rhythmical. It doesn't feel like you're moving and then you're like, oh, okay, I have plenty of time to do this because I'm watching the ball. And that comes from watching the racket getting close to the ball as I'm, it feels very natural. And once you get that idea, then we can start thinking about the first step. Now, one quick thing, we talked about two forms of split stepping, this is one. The other form of split stepping is when we're recovering. So what this looks like is when I'm moving in this direction and what will happen if I'm crossing over, you can see I'm crossing over in this position, I might see my opponent making contact. So you see I lift it off of one leg as I'm moving back, contact. You can also do it where you might be crossing behind and going contact, but you can practice both of these moves where either I'm coming or moving to the left side right now and I'm going boom, pushing off of one leg, or I'm moving to the right side, boom. It's getting better at both of these that really counts and makes you a better mover. So you can move in either fashion. If you're a static situation where you kinda, you're just in the middle, or if you know you're in the corner of the court and there's a big portion of the court open that you need to start shifting towards, but you need to make sure you split step when your opponent makes contact. From here, we wanna start talking about the very first step. Once we land, we wanna make a first step move, which means our outside leg's gonna go towards the ball. So if I land here, I'm gonna use this leg to push and get this very first step. Now this puts me in a position of now pushing off this leg and moving out to the ball. Same thing if I'm going to my backhand side, boom, push, very first step. Now the importance of this first step is making sure that it actually keeps me more in an open sight stance and it changes the direction of my toes. So when I think about whence, what's the most efficient way of moving, it would definitely be moving in the direction of my toes. And so since I know I'm gonna be moving this way, I would split and go here. Now let's say I thought I was gonna have to run a lot, but I don't. Well, I could just shuffle from here and I'm arriving in an open stance. Now from here, if the ball is still coming fast, but I didn't think I have to run as much, all I have to do is rotate, okay? But we're still really just focusing on the first step, but I want you to understand why the first step and how we're moving this way and why it's important. Same thing on the backhand side. If I was hitting a backhand, boom, boom, and I would just move out to the ball. And this kind of wraps up the phase. And so to put this all together, get used to just split stepping first step. Split stepping first step. As I'm taking this first step, 
You notice how I'm turning my shoulders a little bit. This will help me with my preparation. Another way I like to say of thinking about this is if you're gonna shake somebody's hand. If I split and I was gonna shake your hand, I would turn my shoulders. If I split and I'm gonna shake your hand, I would turn my shoulders and my toes. I wouldn't go to you and shake your hand like this. This would be really weird. I would go, hey, and I would start moving to you. And that's the same idea you wanna have. Now we wanna practice the second portion, which is making sure we get to the ball and we're balanced and rotate. So I wanna quickly do a demonstration of what happens if you get there with the wrong foot or what you might have to do if you do get there with the wrong foot. Generally, if we come across with my opposite leg of my outside leg, meaning that my outside leg being my right leg, and I pull my left leg around, watch how difficult it is for me to rotate. So if I try to rotate now, you can see how my body's restricted. I can still swing and I can still hit balls. You still see sometimes in that situation, but this is all done generally with my arm and maybe a little bit of my shoulder, but even my shoulder's trapped here. Now watch the difference if I take one more step now. Bingo, watch what now I can do. I can even coil up deeper and then uncoil a lot more. Now I have the use of my hips, my shoulders, and my arm being dragged along, creating racket at speed. And this is why it's so important to arrive in an open stance first. And so I want you to just get used to, after we come down, walking and finding the ball with your outside leg, which allows you to rotate. So a real easy drill is just to take a ball and throw it and then go find the ball with your outside leg. So if I throw it, I'm just gonna do it really simply, boom, and then walk back, okay? Even though we're kind of incorporating the recovery, I want you to really just focus on getting used to using this outside leg. So if I get out here, boom, and I'll just jog back. And I'll do a bunch of different directions, getting used to using my outside leg to go get the ball. And this is really important because when I do this drill with a lot of students sometimes, they'll go out and they'll reach like this. And this is what you want to avoid because again, you can see how it locks you out. So do a couple times where each time, boom. And if you're really advantageous, you can throw it even further away from you and continue to do the drill. From here, then you want to grab your racket. Now that we're focusing on getting to the ball with our outside leg, we want to accomplish the other two things. We know we can rotate, we want to hit the ball in our strike zone, and we want to make sure we're maintaining our balance. The key is making sure we almost have an alignment triangle where we're trapping the ball. What I mean by that is when I move out to the ball, bingo, you can see how almost these three things in general line up with the ball, meaning my hand, my left hand, my foot, and my racket, meaning my racket's away from my body. You can probably see that a little bit better from this angle. If it's your backhand side, you'll see a lot of times the pros have the racket away from their body, and as they're arriving with their outside leg here, and then here, they have more space. If you're a one-handed backhand, you'll probably depend a little bit more on having the racket outside, away from your body like this, and your leg, because you won't have the use of your opposite arm. So either side, you can see how this works out. So now you wanna go out and practice trapping the ball. So you can see how I'm putting this together now, and I have a little bit more of my swing, and I'm tossing it to myself, but catching it with my outside hand here. Now what we want to avoid is this, if I catch it here, because you'll see in the next drill, if I release it, I can't hit it, it's too close to me. If you have spacing issues, this will help with that too. So now if I throw it, catch it, I can rotate, and it's very smooth. If you're finding yourself that you're doing this, and you're catching it, and you feel like you're too close, get a little bit more distance away and reach forward with your left arm a little bit more on the forehand side. So here, catch, and you can see how very easy to rotate. So the final phase is our recovery, and we have three different methods of recovery. So we wanna do the exact same thing. I'm tossing the ball out, I catch it with my left hand, and as I hit it, boom, I'm gonna pretend like I hit that cross court, so I don't need to sh recover that far away from where I am right now, so I can just shuffle back, and that's all you need to do. So I'll do it one more time. Left hand, boom, shuffle back. I'm in a great position. The second drill you can do for recovery is just using the crossover step. So as I hit, I'm gonna pull that a little bit more, boom, and all I'm gonna do is cross over. Notice how I did not turn my hips towards the direction because I don't really have to cover that much area. Even if I got pushed out even wider, I could do boom. Now, notice the difference here where I got back here. From here, I would probably shuffle. But if I were to shuffle from here, Look what I would have to do. Now this one is where I'm gonna get really pulled off the court a lot more, which is gonna cause me to turn my hips to cover more ground. So now I got pulled off the court, boom. I would hit this shot, boom, and here. You see how me crossing over covers more ground. So if we look at the distance, I can be all the way out here and go one cross here. I can be here and simply go one here. I can be here and shuffle but I would never want to, per se, let's say, 
You can see how I'm taking more steps because I have to do cover. I can't cover as much ground just by crossing over. And now you understand exactly how to recover. Now let's put this together and show you how it would look, me hitting on the ball machine. Now the only bad part about using a ball machine is you don't get to practice your split step. I recommend doing these type of drills where you're just feeding yourself this very low energy as far as like having to react to the ball so you can really nail down the steps and then going out using a ball machine and then hitting with a person or partner so you can start practicing the split step. When I use the ball machine, I'm not gonna be really able to practice my split step. And that's where you'll see me start bouncing a little bit more. And what I'm using, or what I'm doing when I'm using the ball machine is using the timing of the feed to get the correct timing for my movement. So you can see me moving out and using my first step and also building my recovery. It's really important that when you practice, you practice slow until you get it. And then after you get it, you can get different situations where you're either having to move back or sideways. Now that you know how to use your footwork, if you want to know ball machine drills you can use to start practicing, make sure you go check out this video because it'll help you and show you my four favorite ball machine drills that you can use for your forehand or your backhand.